you know, last class we talked about architecture, and so this was sort of the, the pic big picture we talked about, um, where you know the, the high-level view of your computer is you have a CPU doing most of the work, you have uh, main memory where you store everything, um, you have I/O devices, and everything is connected with this system bus um, that is used to shuttle data, you know, back and forth between the CPU and memory and the I/O devices. Uh, and then we talked sort of in the context of this picture about you know, what are sort of the main architectural components that actually enable uh, the useful features of OSs um, that we're interested in. Um, so obviously we talked about this more in detail, but just to give a quick refresher, um, so we talked about uh, user and kernel mode. So remember you can take the you know, assembly instructions that your architecture offers and you can partition them into regular instructions and sensitive instructions. And sensitive instructions are those that can be only executed when the machine is operating in what we call kernel mode. Uh, and so, you know, that's a way to protect processes from interfering with each other or interfering with the OS itself. Um, we also talked about in terms of protecting memory, we have this idea of base limit registers, which is whenever your architecture goes to access a memory location, it'll check that base and limit register to make sure that the address you're trying to access is within the allowed range. Uh, now we talked about uh, interrupts and trap vectors. Um, so remember that that's basically this lookup table in memory. So whenever a trap occurs, um, to fit for the OS to figure out how to deal with that trap, it just goes to this lookup table and looks up some address directly, jumps to that address and starts executing. Um, and so you know that handles things like system calls. Uh, we also talked about I/O, and in particular, we talked about three kinds of I/O. Uh, we had, remember, we had synchronous I.O., which was where you issue a request and your process stops, waits for I.O. to return, and then continues. We have asynchronous I.O., which is where you issue a request to the I.O. controller, and then the process just continues running. And then once I.O. is finished, it sends an interrupt back to your process. Um, and then the third type, we talked about memory mapped I.O., which is where if you want to do a lot of I.O. at once, like a bulk read operation, you basically take a block of memory you pass it to the I.O. controller, and then the I.O. controller can write to that memory directly, and then basically just say, I'm done, and you can go get whatever you need out of that memory address. Uh, and we talked about uh, timers. So remember, a timer is useful for doing things like sleeps in a user program. Um, in the context of the OS, it's useful for doing things like keeping track of how much time an active process has been running on a CPU. So that's helpful with uh, like CPU scheduling. Uh, we talked briefly about atomic instructions. So remember, these are uh, these architectural instructions that essentially can only be executed as a single unit. They can't be split up. Um, and we're going to talk later in the context of things like locks and monitors, how those are actually useful for doing process synchronization. And then we talked a little bit about uh, virtual memory, um, in that there's some architectural supports to provide virtual memory, which is you know, basically an abstraction so that your programs think they have unlimited memory and don't have to worry about the fact that the OS is actually managing you know, only a finite amount of memory. So today, uh, first we're going to talk a little bit more about system calls, um, but then the, the bulk of this class will be on, uh, I'll talk about the basically organizational approaches to designing an OS. Um, and so in particular, we're going to talk about basically four different uh, approaches you can take to OS design. Um, and we'll see that these are not, it's not really that you pick one of them and you're done. Um, we'll see that real OSs often use uh, features from a variety of these approaches, but they'll give you a sense of sort of the trade-offs um, that OS designers have had to make. Um, but before I get into that, um, since we've, you know, for a little while I've been talking about, you know, architecture and how hardware influence OS design, um, I want to do a, a quick exercise first. Um, so, as, sure, as I'm sure most of you know, a couple of months ago, you know, Apple released their, you know, their brand new iPhone 5S, um, along with, you know, the new iOS 7. And, you know, they had a couple of, you know, sort of headline features that they really focused on and said, you know, these are really great things. Um, so, you know, given some of the things we've talked about, uh, we can consider, you know, what do we actually get for making some of those decisions. So, you know, the first thing that they talk a lot about is, you know, the iPhone 5S was the first 64-bit smartphone. You know, iOS 7 was the first 64-bit OS. So, what do people think? What's something that you, what's maybe an advantage of, of having a 64-bit OS on your phone? Yeah. Right. So, in the context of desktops, you know, desktops all moved to 64-bit a couple of years ago. And one of the big things there was that if you have a 64-bit OS, you can have more than 4 gigabytes of memory. 
So who here has a phone with more than four gigabytes of memory? Pretty sure you're all telling the truth. There basically aren't any phones that have more than four gigabytes of memory. Uh, the iPhone 5S only has one gigabyte of memory. So, you know, that sounds nice maybe for the future, but right now, you know, doesn't, doesn't really do too much for us. What about anything else? Anything else people think 64 bit OS might be good for? Yeah? I mean, you can increase register size. So, <coughs> whereas opposed to a 32 bit OS, you could increase the size of the Yeah, so essentially one thing that a 64-bit OS can speed up is if you're doing, say, a lot of arithmetic on 64-bit numbers. Um, you know, that's helpful to have a 64-bit OS because you're sort of operating on basic units rather than in a 32-bit OS you might have to, you know, use the first, the first 32 bits and the second 32 bits. Um, mm -hmm. So that's helpful if you're doing, you know, high-powered scientific computing. So who is doing high-powered scientific computing on their phones? Again, the answer is probably not not really anyone. Um, so, anything else anyone can think of? Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't they have more like I/O buses and stuff? Like, I/O buses. Like, um, the, like I know there's typically like one per four and all that. Isn't there more with 64 than 32? I, I might be wrong. Um, not. I'm not sure about that. Um, I mean, there are definitely you know har other hardware aspects that we'll get to. Um, but we, we, yeah. I mean, like, well, not to go back to first, sorry. Uh, in general, sort of the ARM V8, which is ARM 64 bit platform, has a, a much cleaner instruction set than, <coughs> than uh, ARM V7, which is 32 bit. Yeah, so. so yeah, there are, there are arguments that, you know, maybe this specific, you know, architecture they moved to has some advantages. Um, but, you know, where, where, where are the business majors here? What's, what's, what's one big advantage of being, being the first 64-bit? Yeah. More numbers, higher numbers? Yeah, marketing, right? You know, it's great when you can say, you know, we're, we're the first 64-bit OS, you know, everyone else is still 32. So that's, that's arguably, you know, at least for the moment, maybe the only real benefit of the 64-bit thing. Um, actually, there's also, can anyone think of any, maybe it's not major, but a slight downside to this? Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, non tech actually <coughs> research on this that um, on, like, fresh food, the OS uses 30% more memory. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, were you going to say something about that? Possibly, but yeah, definitely memory is one thing in it. Okay, why, why would memory usage maybe be higher? Yeah. <coughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. Every time you're using a memory address, you're using twice as many bits to store that memory address. So that, you know, that very simple change is going to mean that your memory footprint is going to be higher. So there's even possibly a downside. So, you know, certainly it's great for future proofing and all that, but maybe for the moment, you know, didn't actually do a whole lot for it. But let's talk about this other feature that's been touted a lot, which is, you know, the iPhone 5S has this M7 that's called a coprocessor. So it's got its main processor that does most of the work, but this coprocessor basically takes offloads work that's primarily from sensors. So that's things like data from your camera, or your accelerometer. Work on processing that is offloaded to this extra processor so that the main CPU doesn't have to do it. So what might be some benefits of doing that? Yeah, definitely. That's that's definitely a big one. Is battery life, um, because you know this coprocessor is sort of smaller and more specialized, so it doesn't use as much me it doesn't use as much you know battery power as the main CPU. So if you have all of this sensor data, and you just offload it to the coprocessor, the main processor has much less work to do, and you're probably going to get better battery life. Um, and that would also be an example of you know maybe a different design decision might be rather than adding this coprocessor, let's just make the main processor even more powerful. Now you could do that, but then again, you know, maybe you use more memory um, and your battery life suffers as a result of that. Um, anything else anyone can think of? Yeah. I don't remember if it's the case, but if you're just if you know what your task is, you can make fixed function hardware, which is going to use a lot less. Right. Power right. Than, um, and by area than a, a generalized. Right. That was sort of what I was getting at. Of 
You know, the, the Coke processor is inherently specialized. It can't do everything, but the things that it does do, it's going to be very efficient at it and use less power and do it faster than, you know, doing it on the main processor. Um, so obviously we're talking about a phone here, um, but there's sort of a, a similar analog in, in your laptop or your PC. Um, can anyone think of that? What's maybe a coprocessor you have in your laptop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So a video card. Um, so, for example, almost everything nowadays when you, you know, like run a, a video, you know, you run a high definition video on your computer, you know, that's hardware accelerated. And basically what that means is that you're offloading a lot of the heavy lifting of decoding that video to play it back. You're offloading that to your graphics card. And your graphics card is very, very good at doing that. Um, so, you know, if you, for example, look at your, you know, computer's, uh, you know, CPU usage while you're playing a video, if you have that hardware acceleration, your CPU is doing very, very little. But if you don't, playing back a video is actually very, very intensive on your machine. Um, and so, you know, that again, you know, we've had that in, in our laptops and desktops for years. So the GPU is sort of a, an example of this, this kind of thing, um, you know, in, in, in regular machines. So, just wanted to talk about that for a little bit. So, uh, let's switch back to the main topic. So, first we're going to talk about uh, system calls for a little while. So, remember, system calls are uh, the interface that the OS provides to, for user programs to make use of OS services. Um, so, you know, anything from making processes to writing files, basically anything that the user process is not allowed to do directly because it's, you know, protected by the kernel, you have to do by issuing these commands to the kernel, these system calls, and then the kernel will take your request, go and execute it, and then come back and, you know, either say it's done or give you back the data you asked for or whatnot. Now, typically, you don't program in system calls directly. You don't usually go out and write a program and actually issue a system call directly to the OS. Instead, what you're usually doing is you're using an API that's in some high-level language, you know, C or C++ or whatnot. Um, and so those, those APIs essentially are wrapping all the system calls you're making in an interface that's simpler and easier to use. Um, so the, the most common APIs that you would encounter are, you know, for Windows, there's the Win32 API. Um, there's the POSIX API for a variety of systems that are all sort of based around the POSIX uh, API. And so that includes basically all Unix versions, Linux, um, Mac OS, you know, they all sort of have this POSIX API underneath them. Um, and then for Java, it obviously has, you know, the JVM, which is sort of its own, its own API interface. So I already mentioned some of these, but, you know, again, why, why is it useful to use these APIs rather than directly programming with system calls? It's safer. Why do you say it's safer? Um, well, it's maybe safer. It's maybe safer for you as a programmer because the you know the API that wraps your system call maybe checks for certain error conditions and you know does things for you that maybe you could write your you could write them yourself because remember the APIs are still running all in user land. They're not running inside the kernel. Um, so, you know, they're, they're providing you a convenience um, in that they're maybe handling some of the low-level, you know, error codes that you might not normally handle. Um, what about portability? What does what, what programming with an API do for you for portability? Right, right, exactly. The, in most cases, the APIs are present on a wide variety of systems, even when it's not the same, you know, underlying hardware, and actually the system calls might be different. So, you know, when you write a Java program, you're using the Java API. When you write something that writes a file in Java, you are issuing a whole bunch of system calls, or your program, rather, is issuing a whole bunch of system calls. But you don't need to rewrite that when you run it on some other machine, as long as it has Java and the Java API, because the API is going to handle what the right system calls to use are, how to handle them, and, and basically all of those details. So, you know, that it basically makes, and in some cases, you know, like you can't write something using the Win32 API and run it on a Mac or in Linux. Um, but, you know, many of these APIs basically do give you a significant amount of portability. So that's also, that's also very useful. So let's look at an example of how this works. 
Um, so this is an example using using the C standard library. Um, so let's say we have this you know very simple program in C where we are going to print you know greet. We're going to print the word greetings. So you know as a programmer you're just writing this printf statement. Um, and printf is a function defined in the standard C library. And so the way that function is defined internally, it's actually going to go and issue that system call to do a write. So that's going to go to the kernel. The kernel will execute that write, actually write the word you want um, you know, to, the, to the console or whatnot, and then you know, return back to the C library. And then the C library will return your printf statement, whatever the return value is. Um, and just as a refresher, obviously at some point here, we're getting from user mode to kernel mode, right? Because we have to actually execute this I.O. instruction. So how is that happening? Anyone remember from last time? In the course we're doing this system call, how are we actually ending up in kernel mode? Yeah. yeah. Right, right. At some point, when you're issuing the system call, a trap is raised and you're jumping from user mode into kernel mode, and then the kernel is taking your system call and actually running it. Um, in some architectures, not all, but in some actually, there's an assembly instruction that actually is like the syscall assembly instruction. And so what that is essentially doing is raising the trap to jump into the kernel and actually execute the system call. So we can look at uh, an example of this um, from a standard API. So this here is you know, the read file function from the Win32 API. Um, you know, the exact details, obviously there's, you know, this is a function, it has a return value, it takes a whole bunch of parameters. Um, you know, it's not exactly important you know, what all these parameters are. Um, but you, know, you as a programmer, you don't need to know anything about what the underlying system calls are. All you basically need to know is you have this function and it will cause the OS to do something and then it will give you some value back and that's, that's essentially all you need to know about it. But of course, you know, since we're interested in OSs, we'd like to know a little bit more about how the system calls are actually being sent. So the way this works is that generally every single system call has some identifying number. Um, so that's just you know, a basic integer that says what type of system call this is. And so what internally, when the system is executing a system call, it has, you know, again, like a lookup table says each one of these numbers corresponds to some specific system call. So maybe, you know, system call one is a read, system call two is a write, you know, so on and so forth. And you'll have, you know, a whole ton of system calls. So this is, you know, potentially a big table. But so when you, you know, execute a system call, you're passing in, in internally what's happening is you're just saying, I want to do a system call, here's the number saying what type of system call I want. Um, and I already mentioned, you know, the caller doesn't need to know exactly how that system call is doing it, just needs to, you know, understand how the API is working um, and everything else is hidden. Is hidden. And then the actual library that you're using is sort of managing all the, you know, lower level complexities of that. Um, so, you know, we can look at another example of how this is similar to the previous picture, um, but with a little bit more detail. So when we're issuing that system call, um, you know, we have that uh, lookup number, i, that says what type of system call this is. Um, and so, you know, this, this is sitting in this table, and the kernel goes and looks up in this table, says, you know, I'm running system call i, um, and that points it to, you know, the, the code for running, say, you know, the open system call if we're trying to open a file here. So then, you know, it will ex execute the open system call and then return some value um, you know, back, back to the API. So, of course, in order to do this, you know, lots of system calls will take, you know, a bunch of parameters. So we have to have some way to, to pass parameters. So any ideas of how we might pass parameters to a system call? <coughs> yeah. So put memory locations in the registers. Yeah, so basically, remember we have, so we have pass by reference, pass by value. I'm sure you've, you've all most heard that ter those terms. Um, so, you know, you could put a, a, a memory value in, in your register um, and, you know, pass that to the system call. What's a little problem with doing that? So remember, we're going from the user program to the kernel. So what's the problem? Yeah. So that's true. When you do a system call, remember you have to save all the state of the user program. So that will happen. 
but what is the problem with taking a memory address from the user program and passing it to the kernel? Yeah. Right. Remember, the user program is a separate process from the kernel. So when you end up in the kernel, you have this memory address that's virtual memory from the process's address space. The kernel has an entirely separate address space. And why do we want the kernel to have a separate address space? Why is that important? Right, exactly. Right. This gets back to the whole thing. We want the OS to protect itself from other processes and processes from each other. So everything has, you know, every process has its own address space. So you can't basically directly pass just a pointer to local memory and, I mean, the OS could sort of, you know, do some tricks to, you know, figure out what the virtual memory actually corresponds to, but it's not sort of just as simple as in a regular program. So... If we're not doing that, what sort of what sort of the simplest way you could pass a value to the system call without using like a memory location? What is what sort of the, the let's think think about our you know our cache hierarchy? We have various places we can store things. What sort of the, the simplest, the most direct place we can put, say, a number to pass it to the system, to pass it to the kernel? So what's at the very top of the cache hierarchy? Registers, right. You can take parameters and just stick them into registers and pass that to the system call, and then the system call can go and fetch all of your arguments from the registers and just use those. So that's very easy. They're sort of very, you know, that's, that's very straightforward. Um, what are the limitations of passing everything in registers? Yeah. Right, exactly. You have, A, you have a finite number of registers, so that limits potentially the number of parameters. If you have, you know, a system call with a ton of parameters, you're limited in the number of parameters you can actually call. And then also the size of parameters. So, you know, registers are fixed size and very small. So if you want to pass a big, long string, you probably can't do that with using just registers. So if you're not using registers, you do still have to use main memory. Um, so essentially the way that you can do this is uh, you do pass a memory address, but you essentially have this special block of memory, or it's like a block or a table. And in that table, you basically fill it with all of the, the parameter values to the system call, and then you just pass the address of that block of memory uh, to the system call. And I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but essentially you're just, you have a block of memory and you pass that to the system call. Um, and there's sort of one other, a third approach you could use um, to, to pass arguments. So how do you make you know, a typical function call in a program? Where do you stick the, where do you take your parameters and put them? Yeah, right, exactly. You can also just take your parameters, push them onto the stack. Um, if you're doing that, you also sort of have some other complexities with the fact that you, know, you have this uh, address space issue to translate between, but you, you can do it that way. Um, so you know, those are basically the, you know, the very high level, the, the three general methods um, we can use to pass parameters to the OS. Um, you know, obviously, so we can use we can just store everything directly in registers. But the problem there is that you may have more parameters than registers, and you may not be able to fit everything in your registers. So that's one approach. Uh, the second approach is that you can use either a block or a table in memory. So you know, you have various entries for each of your parameters. You stick all of your parameters in that block of memory, and then you just pass. You take the address of that block, stick it in a register, uh, and pass that to the OS. Um, that's the approach used by uh, both Linux and Solaris. Um, or a third approach is you can basically just use the stack. You can take parameters, you push them onto the stack, uh, and then just as in a regular function call, when the operating system takes over in the system call, it can just pop off those, uh, those parameters and, and use them as needed. Um, and again, the big benefit here of using either the block or the stack method is that you can use potentially an unlimited number of parameters and you can you know, make them of sort of arbitrary size. Does that make sense to everyone? So I've already uh, given you some examples of, of system calls, but again, here's, you know, just as a refresher, you know, we have system calls to do all kinds of things, um, and, you know, the, the names of them may differ um, from, you know, here we have Windows on the left and Unix on the right, um, but we have system calls for doing, you know, all the same kind of things. Um, we have calls to, you know, make processes, stop processes, uh, system calls to deal with creating and writing files. Um, we have I/O system uh, system calls. Um, you know things to do with communication and you know file protection and all these sorts of things. Um, 
Uh, one thing as an aside, um, your first lab, which incidentally will be going out tomorrow, you'll be talking about it in the discussion section, um, you're going to be basically doing some simple programming using um, system calls, in particular uh, the process one. So things like fork um, and, and wait you'll be using in, in lab one. Uh, you actually, in lab one, you'll be doing some Java and some C, um, but in general, yeah, you'll be using the API. But, but in, in many cases, the API exposes a function that is very, very similar to the, I mean, this is not always the case, um, but in many cases, there's, the, the actual system call is, is almost identical to the function that the API exposes. Um, so, I mean, you can call the system call directly, but in general, you will be using the, the the, the helpful APIs. Yeah. Yeah, so, we're, right. Yeah, because remember, the registers are, are sort of directly accessible, and as your program is running, it'll be doing things like, you know, load this memory value into this register, add these registers together. Um, so, you know, your program is acting directly on the registers. And so why, why, is that, why is that safe? Remember, because we, we have multiple processes running, so how is it that we're all sort of letting everyone access registers at will? Yeah. Right. Right, remember, so when you do a context switch, that's when the OS is switching from one process to another. And when you're doing that, you're saving all of the state of the first process so that when you switch back to it, you can restore all that. And the state of a process includes, you know, the current values of the registers. So, you know, basically pro processes can work directly with the registers without worrying about, you know, overwriting, you know, other processes values that they've stored in the registers. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, let's move on to uh, talking about the OS structure. So I've used the word, you know, we've talked about the kernel a lot, sort of in an abstract sense. Um, this picture sort of gives you a high-level picture of what, you know, the, the structure of the OS. Um, you know, at the bottom, we obviously have hardware, um, and then we have, you know, various I.O. controllers that work directly with the hardware. On the top, of course, we have, you know, the users working with user-level applications, so those are things like, you know, system libraries and shells and, um, you know, compilers. These are all things running in, in sort of user land. And then you have the kernel, which is, you know, the part of the OS running in kernel mode um, so that it's protected. Um, so it sort of has all of the, you know, critical data structures um, and things that you have to, you know, protect from, from user programs. Now, essentially, a big question in OS design is sort of how to organize your OS is what functionality do you want to put actually into the kernel versus, you know, putting it somewhere else? Because, for example, you know, you could say, you know, I want my shell code to exist in the kernel. You know, you could do that. There's no reason you couldn't. Um, so we're going to be talking about, you know, some of the de design decisions that go into why might you want something to be in the kernel versus not be in the kernel. So, uh, you know, the picture here is sort of a, a picture of Unix, and Unix is what's known as a monolithic kernel. So essentially what that means is that the kernel is all one unit. So everything in the kernel is, is sort of running as one process. So, you know, inside this kernel picture here, we have a whole lot of things. We have, you know, the file system, we have CPU scheduling, we have, you know, virtual memory, we have device drivers. You know, all of these are executing in sort of one block. So that's what we mean by monolithic kernel. And most operating systems today mostly are considered monolithic kernels, and we'll get into why I say mostly in a minute. But let's look at a, a few uh, actual examples. Um, so this picture here um, shows, you know, the architecture of, of Mac OS X, you know, the, the current Mac operating system. So again, we, as expected, we have the hardware down at the bottom. Um, we have, you know, the graphical user interface is maybe the top level thing, and then we have all of these APIs that are used, you know, for programmers um, to write their programs in. But then, you know, the actual kernel is essentially, you know, just this part. So when Apple says, you know, when Apple is talking about Mac OS X, they really need a whole lot more than just the kernel. So, you know, as an OS designer, you're primarily interested in what goes into the kernel, but, you know, when you're, you know, when you're Apple or Microsoft and you're releasing an operating system, you are releasing essentially a whole bunch of stuff 
on top of the kernel. So, you know, in this example, you know, we have various services for, you know, we have services for playing back video, um, for, you know, doing various things with graphics. Um, you know, there are other things such as, you know, the Java stack that might be considered, you know, part of the OS, even though none of that is actually, you know, running inside the kernel. So we can sort of get a sense of the same thing looking at a, a, a picture of Windows 8. Um, so, you know, this here we have, again, we have the kernel down on bottom, which is here just written as, you know, Windows kernel services. That's the kernel. And then we have all of these APIs on top. We have, you know, separate APIs for, you know, metro applications and desktop applications. You know, we have you know, Win32 over here with C and C++ running on it, you know, a couple of other uh, popular APIs. But, you know, the bottom line here is that, you know, this is the picture of Windows 8, but the kernel is essentially this one little box down below and is sort of not, you know, is not really center stage. And so why do people think that is? So, you know, why, why is sort of the kernel not necessarily as important as a user of the operating system? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, because in this case, uh, there's Microsoft APIs all there to on it. You're never the, the, the developer who's writing the app for Windows 8 or Mac OS. They're never actually interacting with the kernel. They're interacting right. with the APIs on top of it. Right, exactly. So this is getting back to sort of the idea of, you know, users or even users at the level of developers, so if you're programming for one of these operating systems, even you are not interacting directly with the kernel, you're using all these APIs that are sitting on top of the kernel. So as an application programmer, you don't care too much about exactly how the kernel is implemented, you basically care that the APIs are well designed and do what they say they will. Um, and of course, as a user, you're even at a higher level, you know, you're working with the graphical user interface and all those kinds of things, um, and those are all, of course, not in the kernel. Those are all sitting way on top. You know, if we uh, looked at this picture of Mac OS X, you know, the GUI is sort of the top level thing. So as a user, you also don't really need to worry about how the kernel is implemented. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's essentially why, you know, we don't need to, you know, when, when Microsoft and Apple talk about OSs, they don't talk too much about what goes into the kernel, but that's basically our primary interest is what goes into the kernel. So, let's talk about some of the other designs that I mentioned earlier. So, the next design is what we call a layered OS design. So, the idea here is, remember, the monolithic kernel, you have essentially one big box and everything is operating inside that one big box, and everything can talk to everything else. So the layered OS design is very different. Essentially what we do here is we're going to take the pieces of the OS and arrange them in layers, and then each layer is only going to talk to the layer beneath it and the layer above it. So in this example, um, you know, say we lay out our, our OS like this, you know, we might have a CPU scheduler that's talking directly to the hardware, but nothing else. The CPU scheduler exists by itself on top of the hardware. And then the I.O. channel talks to the CPU scheduler, doesn't interact with the hardware directly, and so on and so forth. So, you know, essentially everything is sort of nicely separated in the stack. So, uh, what are some advantages maybe of doing it this way? What do people think? very easily organized. Yeah, so sort of conceptually it's very clean. You know, you have this on top of this on top of this. You know, it's, it's very nice and simple. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very modular. Um, what are some other advantages? Yeah. Security. Um, so in what kind of security? Well, maybe. I mean, remember, you're still, in this context, we're still talking about this all is sitting inside the kernel. So, you know, if you still have, you know, user and kernel mode, you still have all that kind of protection. Um, there may be some security in the sense of, you know, pieces of the kernel itself can only talk to certain other pieces. So, you know, maybe that's helpful for, for debugging, for example. Um, but actually, that's another good one. So, uh, how would you go about debugging something like this? Or say, say let's, let's say you're designing an OS like this. How would you probably go about actually implementing an OS like this? Yeah. Uh, right. I guess if you're building an OS, you could do something that would be real Right, um, right. So you make that sort of make sure it works. Make the IO, make sure it works. Right, exactly. 
So if you have you know, the hardware, we can assume it's presumably functional, and you write your CPU scheduler, and you debug that, and you're confident that your CPU scheduler works, now you can basically just move on to the next level, the I.O. channel, and you don't need to worry about the hardware anymore. As long as you're confident the CPU scheduler works, you know, your, your job as a debugger is much easier. And so you can essentially do that you know, on and up the stack. All you need to rely on is the layer directly beneath you, and everything else is, is sort of not your concern. So, so that's all good. You know, it's, it's you know, easy to figure out where problems might be. Um, but what are maybe some downsides of doing it this way? Yeah, extra over. So, like, what kind of extra overhead? Right. Exactly. So, you know, in the monolithic case, you know, anything can talk to anything else it wants to. In this case, you know, if you have a device driver that needs to talk to the CPU scheduler, it can't do that directly. It has to go through virtual memory, and then virtual memory will go through the I.O. channel, and then I.O. channel will go through the CPU scheduler, and then maybe back up if there's, you know, if it's getting some data back. So, you know, that adds potentially a lot of overhead of essentially just communicating through this stack. Because since you're only allowed to communicate with the layer below and above you, you know, you have to potentially go through multiple layers to get where you're actually going. Um, what about another problem with this approach? So here's a question. Is this the obvious right layer design? Right, right. that's a good, you know, who, who knows, maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, the design, you know, it's nice when you have these layers, but it's sort of a question mark of what would the right layers be, how exactly should you organize them? So, you know, this is one simple example, but you could think of scenarios in which, you know, maybe this doesn't exactly work. Yep. So, um, Probably. Probably. Yeah, I mean, obviously it all depends on how exactly, but if you had, you know, if you're doing you know, six function calls to get from the user program down to the hardware, where maybe in a monolithic kernel, maybe it takes two. You know, maybe you call the kernel and the kernel does what you need it to in one function call and you're done. So, like, are you talking about the magnitude Potentially. I mean, a lot of this is kind of in theory because, again, most operating systems that are actually used today um, are obviously not going to take an approach that is, you know, possibly, you know, five, six, seven times lower. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, in, in principle, this could be much, much slower. Um, and so, you know, most OSs are not designed exactly like this. Um, but one thing that I was going to mention was, you know, we can think of, again, talking about the design of layers. Um, let's say that, you know, the CPU schedule. So the CPU scheduler has state to maintain, right? So the CPU scheduler is scheduling processes, and obviously in order to do that is storing information about those processes. What happens if the CPU scheduler runs out of physical memory to use? In the case of a monolithic kernel, maybe you use virtual memory, which is sort of what everything is using to ensure that you never have to worry about actually running out of memory. But if you've got something like this, you know, your CPU scheduler might want to use virtual memory, but that's two layers above, you can't do it. So again, there, there may be cases where you can't always separate everything such that each layer is always going to depend on only you know one or two others. So so you know again this is bottom line here is that you know this is a nice it's nice and simple and modular and easy to debug, but in practice it may be not so efficient and it also is not always clear how you would actually go about designing these layers. So I already mentioned that most OSs don't really do it this way with one large exception. Does anyone have any idea what that is? What's one part of, an, of pretty much every OS that follows the layer architecture almost exactly? Yeah. Right, exactly. So the network stack is a great example of something that is designed almost exactly like this. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but essentially, you know, the TCP IP protocol stack, you have you know, the physical layer at the bottom, you have the link layer above it, you have network transport application, um, you know, the exact, you know, I obviously won't go into the details of those, 
but essentially the networking stack of almost every machine is exactly this. It's a bunch of layers, and the layers only talk to the layer beneath it and above it. So that's sort of the one, arguably the one big success of the layered OS design is that's used in pretty much everyone's, everyone's networking works like that. So that's just an interesting aside. So you know, I already mentioned, you know, we talked about some of the advantages. You know, it's modular, it's simple. Um, it's also arguably, you know, more portable. And why might this more be more portable? Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, it's, the networking is a very important part of what the OS provides. Um, I mean, is that, is that your, I mean. Well, I just, Uh, probably, but actually we'll get to a case in a second where it's maybe not so clear cut. So hold on to that question for five minutes. Um, so uh, one of the, so why might this be fairly portable? So if you're designing all of these layers, and these layers are essentially using very restricted APIs of the layer below it and above it, right? I mean, it, it, it should be reasonably easy to essentially pick these layers up and move them around or, you know, swap in new layers or those sorts of things because essentially you've got, you know, very well-defined boundaries that make, you know, working on it comparatively easy. Um, and then we also already talked about, you know, some of the big disadvantages. We might have a lot of communication overhead between the layers. Um, you know, there's a lot, maybe a lot of extra copying going on, a lot of extra bookkeeping. And then also the big question of, you know, the design of these layers is not, is not always obvious. Any other questions on the layer design? Okay. So the next one I want to talk about is uh, what we call a microkernel. So the microkernel is essentially the total opposite of the, of the monolithic kernel approach. So in the monolithic kernel, you essentially shove everything into the kernel and it can do everything. The microkernel is the opposite, where you have sort of a very, very minimal kernel that provides essentially only the bare minimum that your machine needs to actually start running. And then everything else that your system might need is provided above the kernel in essentially user mode processes. So in this example, we might have, you know, obviously the kernel might need to operate the processor, might need to provide protection between processes, some maybe low-level virtual memory and communication, but everything else that you would certainly normally think of as part of the OS is not running inside the kernel, it's running in user space. So that would include anything from, you know, high-level scheduling, you know, threading, um, memory and paging, network support, you know, all of these things are normally part of the OS, but in a microkernel, you know, the kernel itself is very, very simple, and then everything else is running on processes on top of that. So what are some advantages of doing it this way? Why might you want to, what's, what's nice about a microkernel? Yeah. More control. How do you mean more control? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, but right, but you can always, I mean, you can always access everything in the kernel if you just have, you know, like system calls defined, right? So you can always pretty much talk to everything. Um, but, you know, these, these things in user mode are all separated, right? They're all running in their own processes. So why, why is that nice? Um, well, actually, you will in general have to switch, right, because if you're running in user mode, you're still going to have to talk to the kernel eventually to actually interact with the hardware. Because, I mean, the kernel is still, the kernel is still, you know, at the very bottom on top of hardware. Um, so, I mean, the, the kernel is, is basically providing, you know, like the mechanism to do, I mean, this is sort of using a few software engineering terms. It's essentially separating policy from mechanism where, you know, the, the microkernel is providing the mechanism to do, you know, scheduling and I.O. and everything, but doesn't say anything about actually how you're going to do it. Like, it, it's not going to say, it lets you schedule processes, but it's not going to actually, you know, do, in, implement the logic of how you actually go about scheduling processes. Instead, you're going to have, 
you know, something in user mode that's actually doing that for you. Um, but we'll, we'll get to efficiency in a second. Um, so, but again, you know, these things are all running in, in separate processes. Um, so how about if there's, you know, uh, how about if you, if there's, say, you know, a, a bug in your file system and, you know, your, your file system crashes? Anything, ha I mean, you know, does, does the rest of your machine crash? Probably not. I mean, if you, if you essentially have this microkernel that is very, very simple, then you can basically move a lot of the complexity out of it. And, you know, these uh, system processes, um, which, you know, maybe may be buggy or, you know, you, uh, may have problems, will not be able to interfere with the microkernel. Um, because remember, these things are all also running in user mode. So even if you have, say, a malicious, you know, process, if you're, you know, you have a malicious file system, it, it can't do, it can't take down the rest of your system because, you know, the microkernel is separate and in the kernel. Um, so, you know, essentially security is, is, is a very nice aspect of this um, because, you know, your, your kernel itself is safe from everything else. And in general, your microkernel, you're not going to expect it to change much. Right, because all it essentially needs to do is provide the mechanism for, you know, CPU scheduling. And once you provide the mechanism for CPU scheduling, you can write any kind of actual CPU schedule you want inside a user process. You could write multiple ones, you could change it. You're never actually going to have to change the micro funnel. So that's very good for, you know, both the security and arguably the stability of your system. So this all sounds great. Uh, what do people think might be the big problem with a micro funnel? There's sort of one, one big massive problem with doing this. And it actually has to do with this thing that I put down in the microkernel communication. So one of the things the microkernel has to do is it has to provide the ability for processes to talk to one another, right? Because, you know, processes by design are essentially separate, and that's the point. But, of course, processes also need to be able to talk to each other. So the microkernel is providing functionality for uh, processes to talk to one another. And in general, the way that that works is that if you have, you know, your scheduler wants to talk to your thread system, um, you're essentially sending a message. You're, you're, you know, one of, your, one of your system processes is going to send a message to your other system, which the microkernel will sp facilitate sending that. So what's the problem with doing that? Yeah. Yes. You have to access the kernel to do that. And what is the big problem when you have all of these user mode system processes that are constantly having to send messages to one another, and every time you send a message, you need to go through the kernel. So what, what if you, yeah. Right, exactly. It's essentially very, very high overhead to have to constantly be switching in and out of the kernel. Um, because, you know, all of these things, you can't just make a direct function call. You can't just pass a memory location. Because, again, these are all in separate processes, which is great for modularity. Everything is designed nice and simply. Everything is protected from each other. But in order to actually have communication between these, you're passing messages constantly. Um, and that is going to mean that you are spending a ton of time going into the kernel, sending a message, returning back, and just doing that over and over and over again. Because messages, I mean, you know, these processes are going to have to be talking to each other a lot in order to actually make your system work. Um, so, you know, microkernels have this big problem with performance and efficiency um, as a result of this message passing uh, facility. So, you know, I already talked about most of this, but the, you know, the goal of the microkernel is we want to minimize what goes into the kernel. Um, you know, we just want the mechanism for OS design, but sort of not the actual policy of how you might do threading or scheduling or virtual memory. Uh, and then, you know, once you have the bare minimum in your kernel, in your microkernel, everything else exists in the US, in the OS as user level processes running outside of the kernel. So, you know, the big advantages here are, you know, it's going to be very reliable. Um, it's very easy to extend because all you have are these, you know, little totally independent processes. Easy to customize those kinds of things. Um, you can always, you know, write new ones to, you know, write a new CPU, CPU scheduler in, just in, a, in its own process. Um, but the big problem is that performance tends to be very, very bad because in order to pass these messages around, you're spending a ton of time just having the kernel pass messages on your behalf. 
Whereas in the monolithic kernel case, in general, you know, if you want to talk to some other component of the OS, you just make a function call, you know, maybe you pass a memory location and everything is sort of just able to, to work with all the data immediately. So um, just a little bit of history about microkernels. So there have been a number of microkernels um, that have sprung up out of research labs. Um, and again, you know, they haven't really, uh, there aren't really any major systems today that are really sort of pure microkernels. Um, but there are some ideas that were incorporated into commercial OSs. Um, actually, both this is true of both Windows and the Mac OS. Um, so Windows, when they were, you know, Windows originally started out essentially as DOS, which was, you know, a very, very primitive OS with no kind of, you know, protection or any of these other features that are sort of very basic for a modern OS. Um, so their big advance was when they came out with the Windows NT kernel. Um, and Windows NT was actually designed as a microkernel. Um, so it, it basically had this idea of as little as possible in the kernel and everything else above it. So, you know, that, that was great. They got all this modularity and extensibility, but when Windows NT came out, it was very, very slow. And of course, you know, uh, having a nice modular OS may be great for the OS designer, but if, if a user buys a new computer and it runs five times slower than their old one, they're not going to be very happy. So essentially, Windows then moved away from the microkernel approach in order to get better performance. Um, so, you know, the question here is that you want all these nice features of the microkernel, but you don't want to sacrifice performance so much. So if you're in that situation, if you have a microkernel with everything running in user yeah. mode, and it's very, very slow, you want to make it faster. So what are you going to do? What's sort of the, the obvious thing to do to make your microkernel run faster when the problem is all of your, you know, all of your processes are running out in user land. Yep. A two-layer kernel. How do you mean? Possibly. Yeah, but remember, what is what is sort of one of the big reasons why performance is suffering in the microkernel case? Like what is what is sort of the high level the, the main reason performance is bad? Right. It's it's you're having to switch between the user process into the kernel process and back over and over and over again. So if you don't want to do that, if your file system is taking up a ton of time because it keeps switching into the kernel and back, what can you do to make your file system run faster? Yeah. Right, exactly. You can take whatever it was that was taking up so much time passing these messages and move it back into the kernel. And so once you're back in the kernel, you're back in the same address space. You don't have to invoke the kernel to pass messages. You can just make regular function calls. Everything is fine. Of course, what, I mean, what is that moving in the direction of to do that? Right, exactly. That's, that's essentially the idea of the monolithic kernel of smash everything into one block Everything's really fast and efficient, but you have sort of the, the details of complexity and lack of security and modularity and all those other problems. So essentially we want sort of the best of both worlds, of course. We want all the benefits of the microkernel with the efficiency of a monolithic kernel. So most systems, most OSs nowadays are basically aiming to do that, and so we normally call them hybrid kernels. Um, so uh, as an example, we can look at the Mac OS kernel. Um, so, actually, one thing. So, you know, one of the popular microkernels um, was the system mock um, that came out of CMU. Um, and essentially, Windows NT also, essentially, uh, I believe some of the designers of Windows NT worked on mock, so they brought over some of those ideas. Um, but the mock microkernel is actually still present in the modern Mac OS system, which is you know, certainly you would not call it a microkernel, but it essentially has this core which was based on this mock microkernel. So what it is, is you have the mock microkernel, which you know, has these you know, basic functionalities of memory and um, you know, inter-process communication and these sort of key things. But then there are other things that have sort of been brought into the micro, you know, it's not a microkernel anymore, but they've sort of been brought into the kernel to enable good performance. So, you know, so the Mac OS system is essentially a combination of mock and um, BSD, which is a, a, essentially a Unix variant. Um, and so that uh, environment includes all kinds of things like threading, command line interface, you know, networking, file systems. Um, all of that stuff has essentially been migrated, you know, into the kernel. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, it's it's probably closer to a monolithic kernel, but it, you would call it if you wanted a term, you'd use a you'd call it a hybrid. Like if you look it up on Wikipedia uh, and say what kind of kernel is it, it's going to say it's a hybrid kernel. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and so actually, this is just uh, so if I you know I'm running a Mac, obviously. Um, and here is, you know, here's my system. And if I go to the top level directory of my hard drive, there's this file here, mock kernel. And that is essentially a big blob of binary code that is, you know, essentially derived from the old mock microkernel, even though, as I said, you know, Mac OS is not actually a microkernel, but it still has, you know, it has roots in this in this idea of separation, and that's that's still used in modern systems. It's kind of like layered. We're actually going to get to in a second. It's actually the next slide. Is how do you actually sort of go about combining, you know, efficiency of monolithic kernels with, you know, the separation and modularity you get both in microkernels and sort of a layered approach. So the way that uh, this is normally done is in modules. So essentially, a all all pretty much all OSs today use what are generally called kernel modules. Um, there's sometimes other terms for them, but it's like kernel modules sort of the most general term. Um, and the idea here is that you still want to design your OS as these independent components. Because right, because if you have these independent components, you have nicely defined interfaces, you have you know an easier time debugging because you don't have to you know worry that some other part of the OS has been mucking with the internals of this component you're working on. You know, you just have these, you know, maybe function calls that say how you can actually, you know, how other pieces of the OS work with this piece. Um, so, you know, it's essentially an object-oriented approach. Um, you design all these kernel modules independently. They're all nice and separate. Um, you know, they talk to each other over known interfaces. And you can essentially load them as needed into your operating system. So when your operating system starts up, it's, there's, of course, going to be parts that are, you know, again, part of the essential OS that you always have. But then, once you've got your basic OS running, you're going to load all these kernel modules. And the big way in which these kernel modules are different from the microkernel approach is that when you load a kernel module, it's essentially taking a block of code and starting executing it, but you're executing it inside the kernel. It's not executing as an external user process. So when you're running a kernel module, you're still in the same address space as the rest of the kernel. You can you know, make function calls directly. Um, you don't have to use any kind of message passing mechanism. So this is essentially how modern systems combine you know, modularity of microkernels and a, sort of a layered approach with the you know, speed and efficiency of a monolithic kernel. Um, there are also some other advantages to, to using kernel modules. So how is it useful to you if you are, uh, say, uh, working on your OS and you're you, you know, you're writing a new kernel module and uh, you know let's let, let's say you're writing you know a, a new device driver for some you know new piece of hardware you have and there are obviously going to be bugs in it as you as you go along so whenever you want to you know uh, whenever you've made some changes and you want to you know recompile your kernel module and run it in the OS you don't have to either you know restart your entire kernel or potentially even worse, recompile your entire kernel. Because if your kernel is all one huge program and you want to make some change to it, in order to actually run that, you're going to have to recompile your entire kernel and that's going to be very, very expensive. So with a kernel module approach, you just are working on a small piece of code, the module, you can load and unload that into your operating system um, and you, know, you can recompile just that module, load in the new module, work on it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's very nice for you as an OS or, or a kernel module designer. So, um, you know, we can look at a, a real example of, of uh, this approach. So this, this shows a high-level picture of the, of the design in Solaris, um, which, you know, as I said, you know, Linux and Solaris and uh, Macs and uh, Windows essentially all have this mechanism. Um, so you might have, the, you know, the core Solaris kernel, and then a lot of stuff that in a microkernel might be sitting in a user process is now seen in a module, so it's still separated, but it's all running inside the kernel. So that might include, you know, device drivers, you know, schedulers, file systems. So if I want to go out and design a new file system, you know, I don't have to redo the entire kernel. I'm just going to write a new kernel module 
load that into the operating system, and that's, that's going to be running as fast as anything else that was programmed directly inside the kernel. So, this all sounds great. You know, we've got, you know, we've sort of got this modularity, we've got the extensibility, you know, ease of use for an OS designer um, that we want with a microkernel, but we've also got, you know, the efficiency of a monolithic kernel. So is this, is this perfect or have we actually lost anything from doing it this way? So anyone think of anything that we are not getting from this approach that we may have had, say, in the, in the microkernel approach, in sort of the, the pure, the pure microkernel? So how about security? So if I write a malicious device driver, is the rest of the OS protected from my malicious device driver? Right, not not really. I mean, yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. You're running in the same address space. You're in the same process. You know, if there's one kernel process, you're all part of that one kernel process which is great when you want to be fast and efficient, but it really means that you can't decide part of this process is trusted and the other part is not. You know, it's, it's essentially, you know, any, anything that's running inside the kernel has free range to do anything. So, you know, we are essentially losing security to do this. Um, you know, it's, it's great that we capture all those other benefits, but you, when you load a kernel module, you're essentially saying, you know, I trust that this code is not going to muck with my kernel, it's not going to destabilize my system. And actually, in many cases, you know, kernel modules can be buggy. Um, you know, especially when a lot of the kernel modules that you might be running might not even been designed by the original designers of your operating system. So, for example, if you get some fancy new piece of hardware with some fancy new I.O. controller, and you might need a new, you know, you might download a new kernel module to actually talk to that device. That kernel module is designed by some third party, which A, might mean it's not secure, but B, might mean it's buggy, because it's, you know, it's new, it's not super well tested maybe, and so, you know, that device driver can essentially take down your entire system. Um, and in practice, what you find is that, I'm sure most of you at some point have seen your computer go through what's normally called a kernel panic. So, Anyone, what is basically a kernel panic? Anyone have any idea? Let's rephrase. What is a blue screen of death? Ever, I'm sure most people here have seen a blue screen of death. Uh, I think it recently didn't change to a red screen of death or something. I thought, it, I thought at some point, maybe not. I don't, I don't use Windows. But, um, so in any case, a blue screen of death is essentially a Windows kernel panic. And so what that means is the kernel encounters some error that it essentially doesn't know how to recover from. And normally that's a result of some bug inside the kernel. But, you know, when you have these device drivers that are running inside the kernel, when you have some bug in there, they have the potential to, you know, cause an error that's severe enough that you take down the entire kernel, you've got a kernel panic, and your system essentially stops running. Um, you know, if you, have, if you have a Mac and you've got a kernel panic, that's when you... Uh, your screen goes a little bit gray, and you get this message saying there was a problem with your computer, you need to restart. You know, that's, that's the Mac version of a kernel panic. But it essentially is, you know, a complete system crash. It's, it's essentially the worst type of crash possible where you cannot recover from it. Um, so, you know, we are sort of opening ourselves up to all these sorts of problems um, by using this modular approach. Um, so, of course, the natural question is, you know, this is a great example of a trade-off. You know, we are essentially trading off the security of our kernel for efficiency. I mean, is, you know, so obviously the natural question is, is that a worthwhile trade-off? Obviously most systems do it that way today, um, so, you know, obviously the designers of those systems thought that the answer was yes. Um, and I think most of us as users can probably appreciate that, you know, as a user it's great to believe that your OS is secure, but if it takes, you know, if it takes three minutes to open Microsoft Word, you, you probably would rather have you know, a 20% higher chance of your computer crashing or, you know, of, of some malicious code. If you, you know, were to go download some random kernel module, you might be okay if that's less safe as long as your computer is much faster. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a trade-off that's been made in modern operating systems. Um, you know, we, we can't really get, we can't get everything, um, but, you know, we can make, make reasonable trade-offs that get most of what we want. 
So uh, to essentially summarize the things we've talked about, um, so you know the, the big design issue is in designing an OS, we want it to be you know we want it to be efficient, of course, we want it to be reliable, extensible, um, we want it to be secure, you know, both in terms of you know secure from things outside the kernel, but also you know from secure from things that you might consider part of the OS. Um, and so you know, we, we've hopefully have gotten some sense of you know how important this idea of your know, trade-offs are. Um, in that there's this constant trade-off often between, in particular, you know, simplicity and performance. Um, you know, it's great to have these, you know, nice simple systems where everything is nicely separated. Um, you know, the microkernel is very, very simple. Everything else is outside, but that comes, you know, that comes with a price. Whereas a monolithic kernel, very high performance, everything talks to everything else. But, I mean, if you're not careful, I mean, a monolithic kernel can be, I mean, could be potentially a complete mess depending on how you designed it because it's just one big, massive software system. Um, you know, the, the amount of stuff that's in your OS is, is massive. It's millions of lines of code. And so when that's all running in one process, you know, it's either, you either have to be really careful about how you go about doing that, or there are probably going to be problems. Yeah. Well, I mean, Linux is, I mean, Linux is kind of, again, it's, it's, you've got the kernel modules, but it also is still essentially a monolithic system. I mean, you could make the argument that modules essentially don't change the fact that it's a monolithic system, because when you load a module, it goes into the monolithic kernel. Um, so you could argue maybe that, you know, modules are a way to design a monolithic kernel that forces some separation and some, you know, cleaner design such that, you know, it's not going to be a complete mess because you en enforce all these nice interfaces between parts of the kernel, even though when it's actually running as a piece of code, the kernel is still, you know, monolithic. It's one, it's one program running. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the terms, you know, again, you know, monolithic kernels are sort of one in the sense of, for performance reasons, everything essentially runs, or, you know, everything that where performance is a major consideration is running inside the kernel. Um, but, you know, ideas from microkernels of, you know, separation and simplicity um, and ease of design, um, you know, have come out in things like, in things like kernel modules. 